20. Welcome to the Alex Urbina Radio Show. The following is paid programming and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHS or its ownership. And welcome to the Alex Rubina Radio Show. Today we're live in the KHTS studio in beautiful downtown Newhall, California. I'm on the radio with uh, my uh, board up here, Patrick. Thanks for joining me today on the show. Absolutely, Alex. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So this show is all about life coaching and how to create maximum value for yourself from a life coach or from the simple willingness just to be open to all possibilities. You know, if you stay open to all possibilities – there's a good chance that you can learn something, uh, whether it's a new perspective, right, which is a new way to look at it. Uh, look at what? Look at any situation. If you can look at any situation multiple ways, then you can have multiple choices, and with multiple choices comes multiple results. But if you train yourself to only look at life in three or four different perspectives, then you're going to be stuck with the same three or four choices and stuck with the same three or four results. So it makes sense that as long as you can stay open to other people's points of view is when you're actually learning, growing, and developing, and your your awareness starts to, to, to stretch out. And so uh, this is a series called Helping You Reach Your Full Potential. I'm a life coach. Alex Rabina. I've been doing this for a little over 25 years, helping people uh, reach their maximum potential and have breakthroughs in all areas of their life. And today we're going to be talking about better co-parenting after a divorce, and the reason why I want to have this uh, discussion and, and talk about this subject is because there are thousands and thousands of parents uh, in our community and, and a lot of parents that have reached out to me that are struggling with trying to figure out how to better parent their son or daughter to help them uh, raise their kids you know, and be emotionally competent and, and healthy and powerful in their lives. And they struggle because they have either had a divorce and they're struggling with some things as well as struggling with how to still get along with their ex and not be frustrated because it seems like or it appears like their ex might be undoing all of their own parenting that they've worked really hard at putting that effort into. So I want to have that discussion with you, Patrick. And uh, feel free just to ask questions and just have a dialogue with me and interact. And anything you don't understand, just throw it at me because that's part of the show. Sound good? Absolutely, sir. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about, number one, is in order to be better co-parenting your kids in a divorce is that when your kids come to you and they're in your care, they're with you for that weekend or for that week, I want you to really be mindful of your ability to acknowledge their concerns because your kids could have concerns about the relationship that has recently been broken or has changed. They might have some concerns about whatever's happening when they're with their mom or their dad uh, on the weekends or something that's coming up. They might bring that to you. And what you have to do is in that moment, see that one moment that your kid has a concern where time just stops. You have to stop whatever you're doing. So if you're paying bills, if you're worrying about, you know, what you're going to do next, when your son or daughter comes to you with a concern, that is a rare moment that kids in today's world come to you or turn to you because they have a concern. So you have to really make that moment special. You got to stop everything you're doing, get off your phone, get off Facebook, get off whatever you're doing, paying your bills, stop, turn your chair, open body position. And you really want to acknowledge their concern, not important, not just acknowledge that that they that they that they have a concern, but I want you to acknowledge that their concern is valid. A lot of times, our kids come to us and they have a concern, and what we do is we automatically go immediately into trying to give them a solution, or come up with a problem-solving technique, or giving them advice, rather than just going, you know what. I feel your concern. I see your concern is valid or I see how you see it like that. And you know what? I'm so sorry that you feel like that. You have to validate that their concern through their perspective is real to them, even though to you it might not be real or big deal or or it's not something that that is a concern to you. You still have to validate that what they're sharing with you as a concern is valid. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes plenty of sense. Uh, however, Alex, what about the, the kids that 
don't actually they have a concern but they're very quiet about it or they give like little subtle hints signs they that's don't a, they don't go right to you that's a great question so just by a byproduct of being a child or being a teenager teenagers and children speak in code and it's your job as a parent to learn code so if they have a certain dialect or they speak in a certain way just know that all children have a specific way of speaking they don't know how to articulate themselves outright they don't know how some of them don't know how to make sense of what they mean or what they're trying to say uh, some of them don't even know that they don't know what what's bothering them so they will come to you and have a concern or they'll share something with you like a story or a, or a frustration but underneath that there's a concern that they have so i'm glad you asked that question because a lot of kids are probably coming to you mom dad and they're sharing something with you, and underneath there, there's a concern, but it's up to you as a mindful parent to notice those little conversations. Notice uh, the words they're using. Notice the complaints that they have, and try to figure out how to get down to the concern. You might even ask your son or daughter, you know, Mike, why are you sharing this with me? Is there something that you're afraid of? Is there a concern you have? What is your concern? What are you concerned about? What could you be worried about so that I can support you? You might have to flat out ask your kid that question. And then your, quick, your, your son might go, you know what? I never thought about it. I don't know what my concern is. All I know is that it makes me mad. Okay, so if it makes you mad, makes you angry, that's valid. I'm so glad you shared that with me. That's normal. But what's the concern under there? Like, what would you be worried about? Like, I'm afraid that, dot, dot, dot. And then he goes, I'm afraid that if I don't say something, my dad will get upset or my dad will get mad. And then you go, good. That's, that's the conversation I want to have with you, son. Does that make sense? You really have to get in there and you got to draw out and try to figure out what their concern is in partnership with them. That would mean that you would have to make a bigger, more intense effort as a parent to try to figure that out. From my experience, most unconscious parents don't even put that kind of effort. They either don't know that that is a possibility or they've never seen that before or their parents never parented them like that. So they just they just wait by default of, well, if my son has a problem, he'll come to me. But your kids don't know how to come to you. Some of them are afraid to come to you. Yeah, I was actually going to bring up to my next question. What about the kids that are afraid to say something to their parents because they, they, they feel it. They know what they feel or at least they feel some type of conflict. But what about those that are just too afraid to bring it up or even just bring the subject to their parents and start something up? That's a great question. And, and you have to, as a parent, be open to that possibility that if your son or daughter is not coming to you and they're not turning to you with concerns or sharing like that, that that's a high probability that you, the reason why your kids aren't sharing with you is because they have lost trust in you. That they've given up hope that when you when they come to you with a concern or share with you their frustration, the way you've been handling it or the way you've been responding to it hasn't been welcoming. It hasn't been warm. It hasn't been inviting. It hasn't been in a neutral way. That it somehow always seems that, Mom, every time I come to you with a concern, I always hear the advice. I always hear the projecting of your fear onto me. I always hear you go into panic mode. So I don't want to go there, so I just stop what? I stop coming to you with my concerns. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So number one, be willing to acknowledge their concerns. Hey, son, that's a valid concern. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's normal. That's natural. And, I'm, and, and thank you for sharing that with me. That's a, that's a great way just to acknowledge that their concern is valid. I think a lot of us as parents, we just overlook that. We go right past that, and we, go, we want to fix the problem. So we don't even stop at acknowledging that they have a concern or acknowledging the concern itself. And then when we're, as we're on the subject of acknowledgement, on top of acknowledging their concern, I want you to be open to the possibility that you might not necessarily be even acknowledging them, your son, your daughter. Hey, son, I'm so proud of you for having the courage to ask me this question or share this with me. I'm so you're such an amazing young lady, such a courageous, powerful young lady. Um it it brings me joy 
to know that you live your life courageously like that, that you're willing to have these deep conversations, that you're not afraid to, to engage in these conversations with me. So you have to really be aware of not only acknowledging their concerns, but you also have to be acknowledging them as human beings as well. And one of the ways that you can really acknowledge your kids without words is with your eyes. Your eyes and making eye contact a little longer than the normal average eye contact that most of us make, right? It's usually like two or three seconds and then we look yeah, away. <laughs> you're away, right? Yeah. But if you can use your eyes and understand that your eyes are a very powerful tool, that we actually communicate with our eyes. I call them our soul eyes. Your soul eyes, when you're willing to have the courage to put them in play, they actually affirm and acknowledge our kids more than words themselves. Right. So if you're willing to just put your eyes on your kids a little bit longer, right, I call it the endearing eyes. Every parent has those endearing eyes. When you're looking at them, you're looking at them like they're the most beautiful human being on the planet. Right, right. You're looking at them like they can do no wrong. Everyone has that one moment where they, they right, like right now, if I told you to close your eyes and visualize your parents standing in front of you, I know you're doing it in the studio, but if you're driving right now, please don't close your eyes. <laughs> but if you're sitting right. there in front of your office, you know, computer, close your eyes and visualize your mom or your dad. There's a certain look that you remember when they looked at you, you felt like you were king. You, feel, you felt like you were the, the most important person in the entire world. And you knew because they looked at you with those eyes, with that look, that you were loved. Now, how do we as parents, one, teach ourselves that that is important, that I have to go back to figuring out how to find those soul eyes so that I can affirm my kids without words? I feel as human beings, we've gotten so used to using words to try to articulate how we feel, how, what we mean. And we forgot that our most powerful tool is in our eyes. And if we use them intently without saying anything, our kids know how truly extraordinary they are, that they are loved. I remember looking back in my mind and remembering every time my dad was proud of me, he wasn't a, he wasn't a vocal guy. But every time he was proud of me, I would just look over and he just gave me this certain look. And I'll, I'll never forget it. That look affirmed that, man, I am doing good. I am an amazing guy. I am proud. I should be proud of myself because my dad's giving me those eyes. So remember, your eyes are a very powerful tool to acknowledge people, especially our kids. Yeah. In all of our relationships. What about like combining certain like senses like you know we have words and we have the eyes what about something like touch alex absolutely human affection is the next level of affirming to my son that he is important to me so here's a great example if you've ever watched a son and a dad um, and it could be a mom it could be a mom and, and a daughter or or vice versa but Son and dad, right? The son is a little upset at himself because he struck out in his little league game. You, you're at a far, you can't hear the conversation, but you can watch with your eyes. And you watch the dad walk up to his son and put his hand on his, the back of his head. And then the kid immediately melts and, and now tilts his head into his dad's you know, body. And then, and then the hand from the head goes to his shoulders and it's a little squeeze. That physical affection right there is a symbol for son, I'm proud of you. Son, it's going to be okay. Son, I'm here for you, right? And so women have that too. When you're with your daughter, you know, you pull her, you pull her hair around her ears. You, she, your daughter's crying. You move her hair away from her, her face. Um, you put your hand on, on their face. Those are endearing moments where we're communicating physically with our affection to let someone know, wow, my mom does love me. My mom does care for me. Some of us have never learned how to communicate like that. Some of us don't know how powerful that really is, that we have forgotten that we have those tools. Some of us are underdeveloped. We've never developed them. And some of us don't have the courage to go there because of the fear of what? It's an R word. Fear of R. It's, an, it's the number one fear. And it starts with an R. And some of you are, I know you're an, 
listening right now going, it's rejection. Yeah, rejection, that's true. <laughs> We're afraid of rejection. And so we don't reach out and, God forbid, I put my hand on your head and you pull away from me. I feel rejected. Hmm. God forbid I reach out and shake your hand because I'm afraid you're going to ignore me. God forbid I open my arms to give you a hug because you're going to look at me and walk away from me and leave me standing there so-called looking stupid, right? So we're, feared, we're afraid of rejection, so we don't give ourselves permission to be so courageous enough to show more affection uh, because of the fear of rejection. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll uh, jump into more of better co-parenting after divorce right here in your hometown station, KHTS. Healthcare can be difficult if you're underinsured or have Medi-Cal. Samuel Dixon Family Health Center can help. Services are available on a sliding fee schedule. The mission of the Samuel Dixon Family Health Center is to give the Santa Clarita Valley access to affordable, quality primary care. There are three locations to serve you, Canyon Country, Newhall, and Valverde. Go to sdfhc.org for more information and to find the location most convenient for you. We all know sometimes people lose their way. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, The Way Out Recovery SCV may have the answers you've been waiting for. The Way Out is the premier intensive outpatient treatment center serving Santa Clarita. Asking for help is the first step. Call The Way Out today, 661-296-4444. That's 296-4444 for a private free assessment. The Way Out is an accredited, affordable outpatient program that accepts most insurance. Call us at 661-296-4444 or check us out online at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. Quit battling with yourself. Ask The Way Out for help today. Marston's Restaurant has been a Pasadena landmark, voted the best breakfast in California by the Food Network magazine. Discover Marston's Santa Clarita location open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Marston's also has a fantastic catering menu that adds a delicious twist to any event. And they cater picnic dinners for that memorable romantic date. Experience Marston's on Newhall Ranch Road and McBean or log on to marstonsrestaurant.com. Can you believe it? Two nights ago, my owner was going to dump me at the end of the street. But I set him straight. I said, hey, listen, do the right thing. Santa Clarita's waste haulers offer free large item pickup or drop off. You can drop me and other bulky items off at their local facility for free or call your hauler for a free pickup. So he clicked on greensantaclarita.com and followed the instructions. It was easy. Don't dump. It's better for your neighborhood and keeps me off the streets. Cardinella's here for Rock and Jump. Jump Sky High is now Rock and Jump, the ultimate trampoline park. Battle all comers in extreme dodgeball. Race to the top on a vertical ops climbing wall and grab a jousting stick and be the last one standing in the X Beam Challenge. Or hit the slam dunk zone and try out your newest tricks in the foam pit arena at Rock and Jump Santa Clarita's premier indoor trampoline park on the Old Road in Valencia. Hometown, your hometown station. And welcome back to the Alex Rabina Radio Show. I'm your host, Alex Rabina, Advanced Life Coach Specialist, and I'm hanging out on the radio with uh, my board op, Patrick, and we're in a discussion, and we're talking about better co-parenting after divorce, if you missed number one, you want to go back and uh, re-listen to that podcast. We talked about number one, which is acknowledging the concerns that your kids might have as well as, as, well as acknowledging them as a human beings and, and the honor of being your children. Number two is going to be remember that quality versus a quality mindset is needed and that Quality is what you want to focus on when it comes to time in your relationship spent. I feel like a lot of parents think that time, first of all, really exists. And time does not exist. Time is a number that we have decided that we were universally going to use to identify specific moments that we're either going to have agreements to either meet up or share or whatever it might be, but time doesn't really exist because 
the theories have been challenged and tested. And it seems like if you spend a lot of quality time with someone, uh, time really doesn't matter. Because there are people that have a lot of time with you and don't emphasize the quality of the relationship or the connection. And then it doesn't matter how much time you have. You felt like I didn't even spend any time with you at all. So I want you to really focus on and surrender that I don't have a lot of time with my kids. I only get a weekend uh, every two weeks or I only get, you know, two days when my husband or my wife gets the whole seven days of the week. You should be looking at more like when I get kids when I have them this weekend, instead of looking at hours or minutes, I want you to look at moments. You get thousands of moments to be able to really deeply connect with your kids and create some extraordinary moments with them that will last a lifetime. I know parents that can spend one week, I'm sorry, one day with their children when their ex has them for the rest of the six days of the week. And that child will spend that whole 24 hours with dad or mom and feel like they were with them for months. So if you have a 24, if you get 24 hours or if you get one hour with your son or daughter, you could allow yourself to be so present, so in the moment, so connected to them, uh, so intrigued in them and so interested in what they are, what they have to share. And you could be so present in the moment that they will feel like they have spent a whole lifetime with you. But that would take for you to really uh, let go of all the distractions in your head. It would force you to be present and in the moment with them. Um, it would force you to really go deeper in your conversations, uh, be more courageous, bring your walls down. You'd have to be more vulnerable with them. But I want you to think more of quality time with them, connecting and interacting and sharing and, uh, and engaging rather than I get more time with them. I don't want you to think of doing this because you can do a lot of stuff. It's like going on vacation, right? You go on vacation. Let's say you just have 24 hours in this beautiful uh, national park. And we can do uh, three dozen different uh, things in that park. Uh, or I can go with somebody and not do anything and just sit around a campfire and really have deep, meaningful conversations and laugh and share and get to know each other at a deeper level. And and, and just be so connected to you and feel, and I felt loved and I felt listened to and I felt uh, li inspired and lifted up that if I, if I have done all those things with you, I might not have, have connected with you at that deep level. So I want you to think more of quality time rather than quantity of time and be willing to surrender that time even matters. It's more about who I'm being with my son or daughter that's going to make the difference with them rather than I need more time with them. Because I have a lot of parents that they're really upset that they only get a certain amount of time as though time actually matters. And I try to explain to them time doesn't matter. What matters is who the kind of relationship that you're creating with your son or daughter such that it's impactful to them, that it's meaningful that it really hits them in their heart, that they feel loved with you. Because I can spend a whole 48 hours with somebody and not feel loved, not feel listened to, not feel important. But I can spend one hour with somebody and I can feel like I am the king of the earth and I can feel like you really appreciate me and you really are grateful to just spend you know one more minute with me. So I want you to just open up your mind to the possibility of, as a parent, am I practicing more of creating quality time, deep, meaningful connections and relationships and conversations with, with my kids? Or am I that type of parent that thinks that if I get more time to do more things with them, it's, that it's more about the doing? So I want to introduce being versus doing. I see your wheels spinning. I hope they're spinning in a, in a positive way. It's actually uh, it brings up a question, Alex. Uh, what about the parents like that are in that like say it's like you only get them for like a day? What about those parents and those kids that don't exactly know like what type of relationship they have since it's they they're with whoever the mom or the dad is longer and then this is the uh, the shorter time? What if they're kind of like not so like they don't have they don't know exactly how to mingle with one another? They're trying to figure it out. You're talking about from the kids' perspective? Yeah, for the kids and even the parent too. So they're they're 
say that one more time. So what if the parent doesn't know exactly how to connect with the kid um, since they never, since he doesn't see him or her often as much? So that would imply that you would have a belief. Let's say you're that parent, right? And yeah. you're asking me that question. Right. It would imply that you have that belief that I have to have had a certain amount of time with you to be able to trust you and to be able to know you like that, to be able to bring my wall down and be vulnerable and share in more intimately with you. Right. Right. That, that yeah. would imply you have that belief true rather than I don't have that belief. I just have this moment that you're here with me and I know I only have you for two hours. So guess what? Since it's my time and it's only two hours, I'm going to just decide that I'm going to take advantage of every moment in these two hours, not every minute, not, not every hour, but every moment to reveal myself more to let you in more, to share more audaciously, to be more courageous, to trust you more in my sharing, to ask uh, deeper questions, to be vulnerable enough to cry or feel my feelings in front of you or to share my fears or share my, my secrets or whatever it is that I need to do to be able to uh, connect with you in a more uh, deeper way. But, it, but it's a valid question because it goes to show you that as human beings, we have these beliefs up in our head that limit us from giving ourselves permission to just decide that I can that I can bring those walls down and create quality time with you anytime I want. It's almost like in in the training room when I have a teen training. Kids will come in and I'll say, "What's stopping you from just deciding to trust the space and trust the the, the team, the staff, the kids that are here, and just and allow yourself to uh, step into that we're one, we're a unit, we're a family." And the number one response is i don't know anyone well who says that you have to know somebody to trust them who said that you need to have already have established a certain kind of relationship to be even give yourself permission to just go to that place if you you're at choice you're the one deciding that you can just be vulnerable and trust somebody whenever you decide what gets in the way is what our past right our past of every time that i have trusted those people when i was five years old and i trusted my best friend with the secret and he or she went and told the whole class and everyone laughed at me that's when a new belief came up that i can't trust anybody i got i have to get to know you first before i actually trust you now so it's all these limiting beliefs that i have from my past that get in the way of you being vulnerable of you trusting your kids um and so there's some there's some psychological stuff that you might have to sort through and flush out and reinvent to be able to have the courage to even be willing to have uh, wearing your heart on your sleeve and being that vulnerable with your kids to create that. Some of us have never even seen it. Some parents have never even seen how vulnerable they can be with their kids. Uh, some of us live pretending that it, that it doesn't exist or that, that it's not possible. So there's a lot of things that get in the way of allowing myself to be vulnerable enough to create quality versus quantity number three is going to be i want you to remember that your kids are still grieving what is grief grief is any kind of loss and so let's talk about some of the potential losses that your kids could have experienced while going through the divorce and if you're living in the illusion that your kids haven't divorced because it's not their relationship they've gone through that divorce right alongside with you in fact you might have overlooked that they've actually have gone through the divorce just like you and they hurt and that they actually are experiencing some losses so let's go over some of those losses what kind of losses could your kids have been experiencing in their grieving process well one they lost a relationship the relationship that was called mom and dad the relationship that was called my family unit uh what else lost could they have they could lost the loss of security i no longer feel secure of myself i no longer feel secure in the world because i've lost this little uh, netting the safety netting the next loss is the word i just used safety i no longer feel safe anymore so i lost that safe place for me to try to figure out who i am and and figure out how capable i am to take on the world and to to develop the confidence to, to live my life in a powerful way what other loss they lost comfort 
They no longer feel comfortable in their own skin. They, long, no, they no longer feel the comfort that this home, this family provided for them to try to go back to, to reset, to, to uh, heal themselves and build themselves up so that tomorrow when they walk out into the world, they can take on the world again. Because now they live in two different homes and they no longer feel safe in either home. They no longer feel comfortable in either home. So they lost that comfort. So they're grieving that. Another loss that they could be uh, experiencing is familiarity. There's things that are no longer familiar. I got a new room, a different bed. Um, it just the, There's nothing familiar about living in either home. So I lost that. And so I'm grieving that process. They've lost consistency. We no longer eat lunch at this time and have dinner all together like this, or I no longer can do those same things that I used to do on a consistent basis. Uh, I used to come home and see my dad sitting there. I felt comfortable just looking over, knowing that he was sitting in that same spot. That's no longer there, so I lost that. So now I'm grieving that loss. Another loss is my identity. I don't know who I am now that I'm not part of this family unit that used to be together. So I've lost my identity. I'm trying to figure out to how to identify myself in this world of this broken relationship. So with that being said, parent, mom, dad, your job when your kids come back to you for the time you have them is to create a safe space for them to share. That's the most valuable gift you can give someone who's grieving is a safe space for them to share, which means that you might have, and they're not going to do it on their own. Nobody just goes, you know, Patrick, can you create a safe space for, so for me to share into? No one thinks like that. But as a parent, knowing that that's what they need to heal, I want you to focus on creating that safe space, letting them know that, they, that whatever they share in this moment or in the living room, that it's confidential and it stays here and that you'll protect whatever they share and you'll hold on to it and you're not going to share it with nobody. So create that safe space. And then you might have to be really good at asking open-ended questions. After you create the safe space, you got to be willing to be a facilitator. Now I'm going to facilitate these open-ended questions for my daughter to help draw out some of the sharing that she needs to get off of her chest. Like, I'm really angry at both of you, Mom. I'm really upset that you guys can't get it together. They need to get that out. And you are your kid's best therapist. I hate to say it, but I don't care who you take them to. I have people coming to me all day long wanting me to fix their kids, heal their kids. Uh, I heard you're the best working with teens, and you're this amazing life coach. Here, take my kids. And I always tell the parents, you're their best therapist. The way it works best is if I work with you to help you work with your kids. That's the best formula. So just know that you're your best, uh, the best therapist for your kids. You just got to be willing to step into that role and trust yourself, maybe get a little bit of guidance, but you can, you can do it. Create that safe space. It could be at dinner. It could be when you notice when your son or daughter gets quiet and they're not sharing. You go, come over here, kid. Let's talk. Grab your food. Let's take it to the kitchen. Tell me what's going on. This is a safe space for you and me and talk. Whatever you want to share, I won't give you no advice. I'll just listen. So create the safe space. Open, ask open-ended questions. And your job when someone's grieving is to ask those questions and listen from a compassionate place. Wear your heart on your sleeve and listen from this compassionate place and just let them share and get it out. Like if they're verbally vomiting all of the resentment and anger and frustration, just let them just get it out into the air. And then when you're done, give them a hug. Tell them how much you love them. Thank them and acknowledge them for having the courage to share. Let them know how honored you are to, to have, have her, be that sounding board and hear them. Give them a kiss. They go to bed. And then you might want to sage your living room so you can get open the windows, let all that energy out <laughs> so that you have new loving energy for the next time they get frustrated and need that space again. Absolutely. So that's number three is remember that they are grieving. They did go through some loss in that divorce, and you can best support them in that. And with that being said, we're going to take another break. Stay tuned for more of the Alex Rabina Radio Show. Right here in your hometown station, KHTS. The best live theater can be found right here in the Santa Clarita Valley. The Canyon Theater Guild has been entertaining audiences for decades with top quality musicals and plays. Located on Main Street in Old Town New Hall, CTG also offers workshops for the young actor in your family. For more information, call the box office at 799-2702 or go online to canyontheater.org. Definition of ease. Effortless and simple. Practical application of ease. 
Ease. That's E-A-Z-E. See, Ease offers a huge selection of quality CBD products delivered right to your door. So take the guesswork out of CBD with Ease. For a wide selection of curated CBD products and great values, go to easewellness.com. That's easewellness.com. E-A-Z-E wellness.com. The Art Gallery of Santa Clarita Artists Association, located in downtown New Hall on 6th Street between Railroad and Main, features local members' original artwork with changing exhibits every two months. Purchase affordable art for your home or as gifts. Open Friday through Sunday or by appointment. Artists wishing to join the SCAA can visit SantaClaritaArtist.org, come to our free monthly meetings at Barnes & Noble, or stop by the gallery. For upcoming shows, check us out at SantaClaritaArtist.org. We make visual art visible. Your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome to the Alex Urbina Radio Show. The following is paid programming and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHTS or its ownership. And welcome back to the Alex Arena Radio Show. Today we are talking about better co-parenting after divorce. I'm in the studio with uh, Patrick, my board op, and we're just chatting. He's being devil's advocate, asking me questions, which I love, by the way. Keep them coming. But we're, today we're talking about better co-parenting after divorce. In case you miss any of uh, the previous first uh, half hour or 40 minutes, you want to go back and listen to some of that. It's pretty uh, good stuff. Number four on better co-parenting after divorce is going to be learn how to be alone. Learn, so, learn how to be alone. What do you mean by that? Alex? That's a great question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to articulate that a little bit. As you've been living your life with your loved one, your husband, your wife, you probably haven't really spent a lot of time by yourself. And so you have to learn how to be alone by yourself to take an opportunity to heal and an opportunity to create a new relationship with yourself. One where you forgive yourself for the things that you didn't know, things that you didn't do right. Uh, an opportunity to reinvent yourself, a new loving, trusting, forgiving relationship towards self so that, so that you can heal and be a better human being, more advanced, more evolved, more enlightened, uh, so that you can be a better parent for your son or your daughter. So learn how to be alone, and that's going to be a process that you're going to have to embark on. If you embark on it with someone to to walk you through it, it's probably going to be a little bit easier. You have more support. But you're going to have to learn how to be alone as a single uh, mom, a single dad, uh, co-parenting, with somebody who you might not agree with in their in their parenting style, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, number five is going to be you have to learn how to work with your ex. You're going to make every you have to learn how to make every attempt to create a new partnership with your ex, assuming that it the divorce uh, transitioned in a healthy way, like you still uh, honor each other, you still respect each other. If it's if it was a healthy divorce, you're going to have to learn how to get on the same page have meetings, get together, talk about uh, creating some new framework because the old framework of parenting together in the house, you can't parent from that no more as much as you try. You have to sit down and lay down new foundation, a new framework for it's called co-parenting uh, after a divorce because we, we're going to have to learn how to get on the same page, be talking about the same things, teaching them certain distinctions, morals, values, and principles on the same page and we got to be learning how to communicate to each other it's no different than you being having a business business partner that's not um, in the same building as you you and your business partner have a business but they're in their office and you're in your office in different locations you still got to get on zoom have discussions get aligned behind each other's values and make sure your decisions are aligning with each other you're gonna have to do that in your parenting you got to look at it like a business with somebody that's not in the same office as you. So you have to learn how to work with your ex. Um, now, if your ex is not willing to work with you, let's call them, uh, for, 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 for right now I'll call it, uh, let's say your, 
your ex is a lost cause, meaning you tried everything, you were open, you're loving, you tried everything, and they just are angry at you, bitter. They're, they're just going to do it their way. So if your ex is a lost cause, then I'm going to give you some different insight. We'll open up some different possibilities. Now, this could be a whole show all on its own, a whole different topic, but I'll just touch on it right now because some of you are probably going, but Alex, what if I can't work with them? What if they're a lost cause? Then I'm going to give you some insight on that. Number one, don't focus your energy on what they are doing or not doing because a lot of you do that. My, my husband's not doing this or my husband or my wife is actually saying these things. Can you believe it? So don't focus on and put your energy on what they're doing or not doing so much. And have your own game plan to give your kids what they're not getting from your ex. Or look at it as I get to counterbalance everything that my, my husband or my wife is doing. So, for example, if my husband is, uh, you know, projecting their fear onto my daughter or telling my daughter, hey, this isn't your home. You, got, you can't, you know, and just doing, you know, right, doing his racket, running his racket, or your wife is saying certain things to them and you know that that's what's happening because your kids are sharing that with you. Instead of being in resistance to your, your ex doing that and getting upset and angry and doing all that, you got to stop, you got to step left, shift, and then add the counterbalance. You know what, honey, in my home, this is, you have, it's, it's all yours. It's your palace. When you come here, you know, it's, it's your home. Choose how you want, and then we get to discuss things. You just get to add from a neutral place. Just add the opposite. Your son's not listen, your your husband or your wife isn't l- listening to them and they feel ignored. Well, guess what? Great opportunity for me to show them that I do care and that here they do have a voice and I and I get to be the biggest ear for them to comp overcompensate what they're not getting at dad's house or what they're not what mom's not doing instead of me focusing on her racket or his racket, I'm just going to focus and be proactive and give them what they're not getting over there. Yay for me. Great opportunity for me. To, to, to use these as teachable moments. A lot of parents don't see them as teachable moments. They're just, get, they're just getting sucked up in reactive and being frustrated because they're, because they're too focused on what their ex is doing or not doing. Does that make sense? So don't get caught up in that. Don't let them hook you into that racket. Number two is stop letting your ex's inability to parent in a healthy way get your emotions. In other words, don't let them tag you. He you, says something to my daughter, hurt her feelings. Now I'm angry, right? Yeah. Don't let him tag you. Don't let him take your power like that. Right. Uh, when you get emotionally charged, your parenting is reactive. You're not proactive. So you got to be careful not to let whatever your, your ex is doing or not doing when it comes to harming your kids. Don't yeah. let it tag you to where you get the emotionally uh, negative, negative emotional charge where now it's got you, you're not focused on your game plan. It's like in sports, right? Let's say boxing. If you're boxing, you got your game plan, and the opponent is now talking trash to you. Psychologically, he's got you frustrated. He took you off your game plan. Right, right. So, ima- so imagine that that's what's going on. Is psychologically, your ex has taken you off your game plan because you're now worried about what he's doing, what he's not doing, and you're sitting there arguing with him, wasting all that good opportunity and those, those beautiful moments are wasted when you could be – healing your kids and looking at it as teachable moments to really help counterbalance what's going on over there. Don't let him pull her, him or her pull you into that racket. And then the third one is focus on adding in whatever you think is missing from the other parents, uh, parenting, just to counterbalance the parenting on this end. And then I want you to see those more as teachable moments rather than hearing it as, what a horrible parent my ex is. Because your son's going to come over and go, guess what dad did this weekend? Da-da-da. And he's going to tell, your son's going to tell you. Or your daughter's going to go, I can't believe that dad did this to me. I want you to hear, see that as a teachable moment for you. Like, start rubbing your hands going, yes, that's a teachable moment for me. <laughs> to get in there and influence her and to counterbalance it. Rather than letting it tag you, you get upset and go, oh my God, I can't believe him. And now you're starting to play his or her game. Don't do that. Play your own game. Play your own game with your own – execute your own game from a proactive place and trust that you'll win their heart and that your influence is going to weigh out balance what, what he's got. And when they do mature, they're going to look back and go, you know what, Mom, thank you 
for constantly just giving me what I needed. You know what, Dad? Thank you for drowning out my mom or dad stuff because you, because I heard your voice loud and clear. And because of that, I'm this powerful young man now, and this confident young woman. I hope that helps you if you have an ex that's a lost cause, obviously decided by you. You're the one that's interpreting this, that they're a lost cause and that you can't work with them anymore. Right. Man, I'm getting all fired up. I'm getting, <laughs> getting riled up here. Right. Uh, number six, um, learn how to not lose your temper, right, is what we talked about, and, uh, and not be reactive when it comes to your ex. And, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much the crux of it is don't give up your power. Don't a- allow what he's doing or not doing or his, his uh, insecurities or his rackets or the attempts that he's making, whether, con- whether they're conscious or not. Don't let that tag you. I call, that's a term where I use. Don't let it tag you. Right. To where you go spinning like a wrecker going round and round and all all riled up because they're not doing uh, – you. So then, they, so then your fear comes in because you're worried about, man, but he – but Alex, he's doing, he's doing everything that's contradicting what I'm doing. So if I'm working with these kids and getting them seven steps forward, when they go over there, he's taking them 20 steps back. No, he's not. No, she's not. You got to trust that – in your ability to inspire and love them and affirm them that those are 50 steps forward. He might be taking them three or four steps back, but you're launching them 30 to 50 steps forward. Right. Because love, love is the answer. Love is always going to be greater than the fear. Yeah. So if you're loving them, if you're teaching them trust, if you're empowering them, if you're influencing them, if you're acknowledging them, that, that is tenfold. The yeah. little stuff that he's doing over there is little – it's minuscule. Just know that you're taping, taking leaps and bounds if that's where you're parenting them from. And then trust and surrender the fear that he's taking them back. He, he or she is not taking them back. Yeah, so They're, like stand your ground essentially. Yeah, just know trust and believe in your parenting if it's coming from a loving, empowering, inspiring place that, it's, that the growth is leaps and bounds to the steps that she might be doing or he might be doing when they're at at their house. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And then number seven, remember that your kids are resilient. A lot of times I think as parents, we think that our kids are really fragile. And the human spirit is so resilient that it can weather the storm as long as we know we have someone in our corner. And that someone gets to be you. You have to decide that I'm going to be in your corner, kid, you're the you're the greatest champion. You're the you're the world champion uh, of the world, and I'm in your corner. I'm your manager, your trainer, your champion, your cheerleader, and we're gonna we're gonna win this. So your kids are resilient. You just got to speak into that resi- resilience and keep reminding them that they can push through, that they do have what it takes, that no one could take their power, and just keep reminding them that over and over. Um, so remember that your kids are resilient, and that your love, your praise. Your acknowledgement will get them through any uh, rough patches, any kind of dad or mom that is talking negative about you or or taking their anger out on you. Just know that your love, you're honoring them, you're respecting them and inspiring them and building them up is will, can bust through any of that stuff all day long. And then number eight is remember that you're an amazing mom, that you are an amazing father, you're doing your best. And if you're listening to this show and you're getting excited and it, it's, it, it's you know, speaking to your soul and it's reminding you of what to stay focused on, uh, just know that you are learning right now and you're, you're acquiring the insight, not my insight, but your own insight and your own wisdom to, to just get clarity on what, you've, what you forgot that your kids need from you. Um, this is your own little inner voice going, yeah, I forgot that my kids need this from me. So it's just a wake-up call. But just know that you're an amazing mom, you're an amazing dad, doing the best you can, and that your job is to keep enlightening yourself, keep learning, keep discovering, keep growing, keep healing your own self. Because there's a lot of moms or dads that uh, we're underdeveloped. We have our own insecurities. Uh, We take our own anger and our own frustration. We react. And if I can learn how to manage that, then then just by virtue, my, my daughter has a better mom just by my efforts to overcome some of those insecurities, flush out some of that anger, 
uh, do some res- uh, some forgiveness towards people that I'm uh, harboring stuff from the past. If I can do that, the past work, the healing of the past, letting go of the past, and do that with someone, a professional, um, a, a therapist, a coach, whoever guides you through that, then you're just you're becoming a better dad for your kid. You're being you're learning how to be more vulnerable. You're learning how to to make eye contact, to actually develop a connection with them, so they can be seen, they can be heard. So just remember that you're you are um, you are you've gotten your kids for a reason, uh, and that you're uh, blessed with this gift to help your kids, to help heal them, to affirm them, and really teach them how to uh, take on life. Right. And don't be guilty because you you so called failed in a relationship. No relationship is a failure. There's just a learning opportunity. Learning curve, yeah. It's a learning curve. And so don't beat yourself up because, you know, you had to put them through a divorce. Um, divorce is an opportunity for all of us, including our kids, to learn something about ourselves. The question is, as a parent, are you, gonna, are you willing to see it like that and be willing to learn the things that you need to learn to heal yourself, but also learn how to heal yourself so that you can help heal your kids and spring forward them into teaching them now what a beautiful relationship looks like. So if you've gotten out of divorce, it's probably because you either realize I'm not in love with the person no more or, am I, or I never was or I was miserable. But the divorce could be a springboard for you to go, you know what, I found out what my – I realized one day what my worth is. I realized what I'm willing to tolerate, what I'm not willing to tolerate. And I just I, – I decided I love myself more than to stay in this if, it's, if I can't fix it if the other person doesn't want to work with me, and then I've chosen to set an example for my kids so they can look and go, man, so that when they're, when they're in their 20s or 30s, they go, man, I'm so glad that my mom divorced my dad. I wish she would have had the courage to have seen that sooner, but I'm glad that she did because, she, because of that, she found uh, her own self-worth. She blossomed and found her own power, and that she, that she is deserving to be loved and, and treated uh, like the beautiful woman that she is, and, to, and she found herself and someone to love and finally be happy and vice versa i'm so glad that my dad you know finally divorced my mom he he's a different guy now and he's now loving and giving and he's a different kind of a dad i think your kids would rather you uh choose to make something positive moving forward from a divorce rather than becoming miserable and using that that being miserable to parent your kids in a way where you're projecting all that onto them that's all the time we have. I want to thank you guys for listening in. I really appreciate you taking the time, especially if it was for the whole hour, hanging out with me right here on the Alex Sabina Radio Show on your hometown station, KHTS.